What is shaking, everybody? It is a new episode of the Wind Up Podcast, and this week we are getting into whether or not consultants are ruining the wine business. Uh, this comes hot on the heels on a couple of things. One being an Instagram post that I was tagged in last week uh, that was actually posted a couple of weeks ago, uh, but then also an article that came out on winesearcher.com, kind of diving headfirst into this issue and kind of some of the things that people are taking into consideration. Uh, before we dive into this, I again always want to thank everybody for, of course, tuning in, downloading, subscribing, doing all the things. Uh, please make sure you follow us on all of our social networks at MTGA Wines. Uh, be sure to check out the video feed on YouTube of the podcast here, as well as tasting notes, updates. Uh, we try to post everything everywhere. That way, if you want to see kind of day in the life as it happens, winemaking stuff. That's where you can find it. Uh, we do a lot of that on Instagram, YouTube, uh, and of course, a few other of the networks, the Book of Face, the social network formerly known as Twitter. You all have heard me mention that uh, time and time again. Uh, be sure as well, if you have a quick, quick second to rate and review the show wherever you're consuming your podcast, if you have a quick moment to give us a little star rating, uh, write a comment about how you're enjoying the show, uh, even any critiques, we'll take what we can get uh, to try and improve and do things a little bit better as the years continue to go on. All right, enough of the business side of things. Let's go ahead. Oh, one more announcement, actually. There is one more announcement that I have. Uh, if you are keeping an eye on when we're going to be hitting the road for different tasting events and things around the country, uh, we currently have tickets available to uh, events this April in Kansas City and in St. Louis. Uh, please head to our website, mtgawines.com. You can go to the shop. That's where those tickets are available. Uh, the event in Chicago has already sold out. If you need to be on the wait list, please hit us up and we'll get you on the wait list and hopefully find you a spot. All right, now that concludes the rest of the business. I almost forgot. I got to do a little bit of the shameless self-promotion. You know, we're making we're making waves getting out and about, slinging some wine around the country this spring. We got to let you know about it. All right, let's dive into this thing, shall we? I'm. You might notice I'm a little bit like hyped up. I'm a little excited. Little, uh, you know, this is. I mean, this is just something that I I'm so excited that this has kind of popped up again in terms of the wine media uh, to give you a little background on kind of how this consulting winemaker conversation came up. Uh, Karen McNeil, um, who is a, a wine industry icon, she is the author of the Wine Bible. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that particular book. Uh, she does an amazing work with her blog, uh, reporting and all kinds of other things and competitions and ratings and reviews. I mean, she's done it all. Uh, she's a champion and very, very sweet. Uh, luckily, we see her around town pretty regularly. Uh, she's, as far as we're concerned, you know, kind of that local and she's got her ear to the pulse of the wine industry, arguably better than anybody. And she was on Instagram. Uh, this would have been a couple of weeks ago, and I actually tried to bring it up on my computer, but couldn't quite find it. So I'm going to bring it up on my phone. Uh, to hopefully give you guys an idea of how this conversation kind of started. Because we've talked a decent amount about consultants on this show and whether or not, you know, certain things are happening in terms of the homogenization of Napa wine and are, is, are things getting less interesting and are all these people kind of all fighting for the same style at this state. So this is this is her post and this is post premiere Napa Valley, which we uh, talked about a couple episodes ago as well. So hot on the heels of being able to taste through just an immense amount of some of these wines that we're talking about. So this is the post and you can go to Karen McNeil Co on Instagram and read this for yourself. Uh, this is a post from February 26. So it is from a few weeks ago. Uh, all of these winers employ the consultant Philippe Melka. Some of you may be familiar with his name. Uh, all of these winers make plush, soft, well-structured, very expensive Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Is it a problem if many of them taste largely the same? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, it started to snowball into about 68 comments. Uh, all kinds of folks weighed in uh, 
you know, kind of poking holes in whether or not certain specifics are mentioned, how are the similarities in these wines being measured, people saying, hey, this is a great conversation, but only something that only a few people within the industry can follow. Uh, all very valid opinions, all very interesting to see how people reacted to it. And I think the top comment was simply, this is a conversation that we need to be talking about more, which I couldn't agree. Now, this was followed up by an article uh, just a few short days ago. This was on Monday, March 18th. Uh, so this literally uh, came out just a couple of days ago. And this was from uh, W. Blake Gray on winesearcher.com. I will actually post links to all this stuff uh, in the description of this episode. So if you want to go and check this out for yourself, please do. And this was a an article that kind of just, you know, expanded upon this, you know, Instagram post, realistically. And it is titled, Does Napa's Famously Rich Style Trump Terroir? One expert thinks it's time to have a hard conversation, referencing Karen McNeil and her post. Now, I'm not going to go through the, the whole article here, but I'm going to dive into kind of what I took from them. This is going to be the kind of opinionated episode of whether or not I think consultants are actually doing more harm than good to the wine industry as it stands right now. The one thing I will quote from this article uh, was from uh, Philippe himself. Uh, he didn't want to say too much, according to the author of the article, but he did say this, quote, Overall, my DNA is all about ter terroir. As I started my career as a geologist winemaker promoting Napa Valley terroir, I have been making wines in Napa since 1991 and presenting wines at the auction since 1995. This would be in reference to Premier, I believe. Uh, this is the first time I'm hearing something like that. It is difficult to argue the palate of someone. Now, take what you will from that quote. And I think it's an interesting one because he didn't say much other than he, of course, trying to kind of extol the virtues of Napa Valley terroir. And for those that don't know the concept of terroir and kind of what that means, it is a French term that kind of encompasses all things winemaking, the soil, the climate, the winemaker, the barrels, the cellar. Um, it, it's kind of this one catch-all term that wine has this kind of, it's this kind of esoteric term where it kind of means everything and it kind of means nothing. But what I've always kind of understood terroir to really mean is that you're trying to give a wine a sense of place, that when you're drinking a Napa Valley Cabernet, you know it's coming from Napa. If you're drinking Australian Shiraz, you know you're drinking Australian uh, Shiraz, and so on and so forth. Depending on what variety it is, who's making that wine, and where it's being grown and made is going to have a specific impact and represent that area. Now... With the advent of modern technology and new winemaking techniques, it is easier now to fabricate that kind of stuff. It's easier to manufacture a wine in California and say, hey, let's make this taste like Bordeaux. You can make something in Australia and make it taste like South Africa. You can make something in France and make it taste like something from the US. You can do all of these things because of what we have at our disposal now as winemakers. Typically, do producers do this? Not really, especially when you talk about European producers. They're very rooted in tradition. You have generation upon generation of winemaking families and businesses there that need to maintain a specific style and really highlight that terroir that we're talking about here. When it comes to the new world, it's a little bit more wishy-washy. And it's really because this is the Wild West, we're simply far less regulated than a lot of our counterpart countries in the winemaking world. Uh, it's a lot easier for us to do whatever the hell we want. And this is, I think, both a gift and a curse when it comes to trying to define what style, let's say Napa in this situation, is trying to achieve. Now, the crux of this issue, are consultants homogenizing Napa? Are they ruining Napa? Is this, or, and maybe even other regions around the world, as it stands right now, I would lean towards yes. And the reason is because of my own personal experience with not just winemaking teams 
but with other producers and suppliers of different goods within the wine industry. Now, there's going to be some geeky kind of winemaking details in this. I will try to keep it kind of as clean and as simple as possible. That way, you know, I don't go too far down this rabbit hole. Now, to give you a little bit of a backstory, you know, into the 90s and the 2000s, you had a lot of people buying into the wine industry out here. It wasn't just the the hobby or the gentleman farmers who kind of pulled themselves up by their bootstraps to try and create a wine project. It became a lifestyle. It became the hobby of the rich and the famous who did really well for themselves. And the next thing was to invest in the wine business. And they liked wine, but didn't know a damn thing about making it. So what do you do? You hire someone who knows a lot more than you do. Enter the consulting winemaker, uh, Philippe Melka being one of these people. Um, you can go to his website, Atelier Melka. Um, I'll post a link to that. And by my count, just kind of scrolling through the different brands that are featured kind of on the main page there, there's 30 plus different places just in Northern California that he's consulting for, much less some of the other places he consults for around the world. Um, he has his hands in and around a lot of different wine projects. And I think it's interesting because they kind of run the gamut in terms of pricing. You have some that are under a hundred bucks, maybe in the mid hundreds, all the way up to 600 plus dollars a bottle. There's a huge range of wines that he works on in terms of what people might consider, you know, quality or cult status or small production versus large production and so on. Uh, some of these include uh, Davis Estates, Raymond and Vineyards, Donna. Um, you have his own wines. You have, uh, shoot, there's a bunch of Adamus. You have uh, Roy Estate. You have, oh my goodness, Maryvale's on there. Uh, Crown Point, uh, Nine Sons, uh, just a handful of the wines that he works on there. Now, when I talk about kind of consultants, it's going to be more in general terms. I'm not here to try and pick on Philippe. I think he's actually a good dude. I've had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times. He was always super cool, super nice, obviously very, very talented. There's a reason why folks have hired him to make some really, really great wines over the years. But I do know this about consultants kind of in general, and this comes more so from my experience of working with other suppliers, with other growers in particular, not even on the winemaking side. And I think this is a good place to start because one comment in that Instagram post pointed out that, hey, even though someone like Amelka is consulting on a wine project, there is typically an on-site winemaker or cellar master who handles the day-to-day. -day. Philippe is not at all 30 plus of these wineries every single day or even once a week, making sure that things are going the way they need to be going. He'll be checking in and out to make sure that everything is on track, but very, very typically, there is someone there taking care of that day-to-day -day labor for him. There is an on-site winemaking team. And what I did really agree with this as kind of a continuation of that comment was that as a result, there are going to be subtle differences in these wines because you have different hands managing them. You know, what's happening at Nine Sons is going to be very different than what's happening at Raymond, which is going to be very different than at Roy or CV or whomever else. There are going to be a lot of different people working on these wines. And as a result, that's going to help maintain the uniqueness and the terroir of these wines. And I agree with that to a certain extent. The reason why I think there's a very finite kind of end to that and a very thick line in the sand is because of the following two reasons. Number one, I've had plenty of friends work for many consulting winemakers. And number two, I work with plenty of barrel producers that sell barrels to these consulting winemakers. And between these growers and these friends, as well as the folks that are supplying barrels to these some of these folks, you can't, it's just, there is just this blatant homogenization from and kind of cookie cutter process from one project to the next. Plain and simple, you cannot argue with it. Because this is what happens with some consultants. Maybe not all of them, but with some of them, this certainly happens. One, there's a certain game to be played of making wine by the numbers. Certain winemakers are measuring tannin levels, phenolics, acidity, pH, insert 
cat, you know, qualifying, you know, measurable thing here, and they're trying to hit a specific number. That's what gives them their secret sauce. It's what allows them to say, hey, this is why I make the style of wine that I do is I focus in and key in on this thing. And if you want me to make wines like this for you, this is what I can focus on for you. It's part of their recipe. It's how they go about ensuring that they have their own house style that they bring into these other projects. And instead of this is kind of where I think it'll be a little uh, a little contentious is instead of making wines for that producer in their style, they're making wines for themselves in their style from that producer, if that makes sense, because they're just keying in on this one thing and kind of throwing a lot of the baby out of, with the bathwater and saying, hey, I understand you've been making wine like this. This is how you've been doing things forever, but this is how I make wine. And if you're hiring me, this is how we're going to do things. A compounding issue is the purchasing of barrels. Now, we've talked about barrel programs on this show is that, you, you know, plenty of times and that very typically when you're making wine, you're buying particular barrels to truly really try and highlight the different flavors, the different characteristics, and really kind of extol the virtues of that vineyard of those winemaking procedures. They are quite literally the spice rack that we use to help enhance our wines and also build consistency within our programs. Because even though a year might be different from one year to the next, the barrels will also stay relatively the same. By adding another layer of complexity, we're actually helping keep things consistent because we're utilizing, you know, the same products kind of year in and year out in the form of barrels. I mean, imagine using... Uh, I mean, let's say like Himalayan sea salt versus a different type like iodized, like movie theater salt. Like there's a difference between those two things. And if you want consistency one way or the other with your popcorn, you might be adding one or the other based on your personal preference. Kind of a weird way to think about it, but that's in essence what a barrel does. It's seasoning the wine, right? Now, of the cooperages that I work with, there are more than a couple of them. Not the one with the hat that I'm wearing. I'm going to turn that around for a second. You'll probably see it. It's who cares. Um, actually, this is not a con. It's funny that I'm wearing this hat, having this conversation. I did not talk to them about this, actually. Um, but uh, there are a handful of others that have said this, that when a new consulting winemaker signs on to a project, they know whether or not they're actually going to be able to sell barrels to that winery because some of these consultants will come in and say, hey, I understand you've been using these barrels. We're not using those anymore. These are the barrels that I use for my winemaking. And they specifically dial in that barrel program to a T based on their own stylistic considerations. So imagine that you're one of those cooperages and you've been selling barrels to a producer for you know, five, 10, 15 years, all of a sudden a new hire is made and whoosh, those sales vanish because this person says, hey, this is how I make my wine. We're not going to include these other cooperages. Now imagine that that person who signed on is also consulting for many, many other projects and doing the same thing all the way down the line. If that's not homogenization, I don't know what is. So this kind of stuff happens. It's no secret that there's in essence, a recipe to winemaking for many consultants that are out there. There's a very specific style that's being made and they are doing their best to adhere to it because they want to be known for their wine. Now, it's not that they're completely dismissing the stylistic considerations of the company they're working for. Hopefully they're not because, you know, it's their job to still do right by them contractually, right? That's typically how it goes. But I find it interesting that these things are true, that there are these certain numbers, there are these certain barrel programs that are just kind of ubiquitous throughout these certain consulting individuals that say, hey, if I'm going to be making your wine, this is how we do things. And not necessarily take into consideration, you know, what's been done previously, and what the goals of that particular business is. You know, for me, in the consulting that I've done, it's, this is going to sound a little weird, but it's my goal to kind of work myself out of a job that at a certain point, that on-site winemaking team, whoever that may be, is able to take the reins and say, Hey, 
I know how to do this. This is the style we want to achieve. Let's move forward from here. I think any good consultant, it's, it's counterintuitive, but that's why they're consulting. They potentially know more, have a certain talent or skill set that you want to bring in and incorporate. However, hopefully you can learn a thing or two and not have to pay those extra bills on down the line unless they continue to do just a really great job. And maybe you do need to supplement that work somehow rather than having another full-time employee at your disposal. Of course, that's a business decision that you got to figure out on your own. But it's just, it boggles my mind that folks don't think that this is an issue or that they kind of dismiss it as like, oh, there's only a handful of people that would ever notice this kind of thing. And what's interesting is that something that many of us preach is that, you know, if you're, if you like a certain wine, find out who that winemaker is, find out who's actually doing that. Maybe if you love Nine Sons, you want to check out Roy Estate because Melka has his hands in it, or maybe the Phase 5 wines from Davis, or maybe Raymond Generations, whatever the case may be. You want to try to track down more of these wines. And I think this is the, the question, you know, in regard to this homogenization and how things are continuing with just a handful of, you know, quote, kind of top winemakers in Napa making the majority of high-end wines is if let's say you're paying, you know, around a hundred bucks for a bottle of one of these wines, and then you go over to Raymond, you buy their generations for a buck, I think they're a buck 80, buck 90, something now, 180, $190. And then maybe you head over to Davis and you're buying these phase five wines for $200 plus. And then maybe you end up at Donna Estate and they're talking $600 or more. You know, if you're buying wines being made from the same consultant, at this huge kind of range of pricing, and they're all very, very similar in style, maybe not identical, maybe they have their own kind of cool little kind of quirks about them, but if they're all good enough, are you, the consumer, gonna feel kind of pissed off that you paid $600 for a one bottle of wine when you could have paid less than 200 or maybe even around 100 bucks and gotten something that is of equivalent quality? I think that's what this conversation really needs to be about because that's what i would do as a consumer if i know that you know and milk is a great example because he has so many wines that he makes there's a huge range of price points to these wines and those donna wines are no joke they're super yummy but if i can get a bottle of you know raymond generations for a third the price that's very very solid why wouldn't i right and i think this is where this homogenization issue starts to come to a head where maybe these wines aren't identical. And I think Philippe does do a good job of, you know, relying on terroir and trying to express, you know, what a wine has to offer. I think this goes back to his days at Gemstone. Um, when he when he was making those wines, they were some of my favorite wines in the Valley, and I thought they were unique, as were a lot of his wines. And even his own wines under his own label, I think, have their own characteristic. I, I, there are plenty of consultants out there that I think do a fine job, but there are also another handful that are like, this is how we do things. I don't care where your fruit's coming from. I don't care what your seller's like. This is how we do things. And you see this stylistic just malaise kind of happening because there's not enough creativity anymore. Things are being kind of masked and bottled up in a way that are like, hey, this is just how it has to be done versus, hey, what can we do to be different, right? And I think that is the kind, those are the kinds of questions that this conversation leads to. I understand why people would be, you know, interested in like, oh, well, how many consultants are there? And realistically, are they really making kind of all the same wine? You know, my gut reaction is yes. You know, this is something that I've talked to many folks about over the years. And one of the reasons why Merlot became such a focus for me is because in the 2000s and into the 2010s, I was super disenchanted with Napa Cab. I thought it sucked. I thought it was going nowhere fast because of this issue. More and more winemakers were making more and more of the same wine because they were chasing a certain style, maybe ratings or reviews, or maybe the same consultants were being hired across many, many properties. And I felt that if you go back to maybe the mid 2000s 
and back into the 90s, you saw more people with uh, just more creativity. There was more uniqueness. There was something to be kind of sought after with some of these producers. And as the years have gone on, I am just based on tasting them. I'm like, cool, this is another big slutty Napa cab. Like, what do you want me to say about this? You put it in a lineup against, you know, 10 other wines. They all taste relatively the same. I'm like, okay, well, these are all pretty much, they're good. They have subtle differences. That one's four times the price of that one. I'm going to buy the cheaper one. That's what it's coming down to. And I don't think that folks have started to take this conversation to that next step. Because if you continue to have, a small handful of people making the vast majority of high-end wines and there's this huge range of pricing, what's going to happen when more and more people understand that they can now find these really great values from the same winemaker or winemaking team compared to maybe someplace else that's like, you know, hey, we got to wait a year to get on the allocation list and then hopefully buy it at some point. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. And I don't know if there's going to be, you know, like some silver bullet that fixes this. In fact, I don't think there is. I think, you know, this is already, this is already moving. This is already shaking. There's no putting this genie back in the bottle. You know, I, you know, I think, and this was, you know, from this article as well on Wine Searcher, um, someone was quoted as saying that they thought that Napa overall has lost its soul. And... I don't think it's a moral thing. It's more just like, hey, there's no hurt here. There's no X factor. It's just like people are just kicking out wine for the sake of kicking out wine. And they're all chasing the same style with these handful of consultants that are doing most of like this, these big name wines these days. And I agree with that. I mean, I'd be hard pressed for someone to convince me otherwise. It just doesn't, that just doesn't compute. Now, you all know I like, you've been listening for any period of time, you know full well that I try to play nice on this show. I try not to call out too many names. I try to, you know, not talk too much shit. But, you know, at a certain point, and and to kind of, I guess, continue in that vein, you know, if people are still buying these wines and they're not necessarily interested in who's making them or why they taste similar, they just, hey, I know I love big, sexy Napa Cab. I'll get as much of it as I can then this just continues and all is well in the world. I don't know. Like it just, maybe that's the thing, you know? And if there's, man, if there's just, I mean, it's the one thing that I try to, you know, extol the virtues of like supporting the small businesses and and the family operations out here and knowing who's making your wine and how it's being made and what goes into it. All that is so, so important. And if most people simply don't care about that because they just want their big, sexy Napa cab, I mean, then this, this conversation is a non-issue because if the consumer base who buys these wines doesn't give a shit, then the winemakers aren't going to give a shit. They're like, hey, this wine sells. Therefore, we're going to just continue along this path with our heads in the sand because realistically, who cares? Who cares? People are buying it. Who cares? You know, I, I think that they're, it's something that kind of, it hurts, hurts the soul a little bit where you're like, ah, I mean, you want people to care. You want people to understand like, Hey, you know, this person's making wine for 30 different brands, put all 30 of those in a lineup. Do you think they're similar? Yes. No, maybe my guess is I mean, if the same person has his hands in 30 different wines, they probably should be similar, you know, if that person's pretty good at their job, but they shouldn't be so similar that they can be mistaken for one another. They also shouldn't be so similar that they compete with one another, right? There should, if you have something like a Raymond Generations in your cellar, you might want some Davies Phase 5 or some, you know, Nine Sons or some Roy or CV or whomever. Like, you you want to have these unique wines. And if you have this very talented winemaker, and Philippe definitely is one of them, that can kind of extol the virtues of these individual properties and make unique wines while still having kind of this common thread of like, hey, if you like CV, you'll probably like this. Uh, if you like 
you know, if you like Raymond, you might like Quixote, if you might like this and so on. Like there are going to be, you know, certain like common threads. Like that's cool because you can kind of, uh, going back to that concept of terroir, be like, hey, this is still unique. This still retains kind of this great intrinsic value of being something interesting while there's this really awesome common thread from this guy who just knows how to craft a wine in that way. Do I think that that's what's going on with most of the consultants in Napa? No, I don't. I don't think that that's really a consideration. I mean, maybe it's a consideration, but I think more often than not, certain consultants are known for a certain style and that's why they're hired and that's the wine they make. And as a result, you see more and more wines within this area becoming more and more similar. I just think that's the way it is. I think that's the way it is. And I, and I don't know, I almost equated, I thought about it this way as well. And we've talked a little bit about like Andy Beckstoffer and some of the, the, the heritage vineyard sites, the Tokalon Vineyard, Bourne, Dr. Crane, um, George III, you know, some of these very fancy, very expensive cab grapes that he farms. And this is an interesting thing, you know, for folks that I know who have worked with that fruit. One, you know, he does a damn good jo job farming it, like say what you will about the pricing of his grapes that I think is offensive, but, you know, is what it is, good on him. You know, you have vineyards that are buying these grapes at a high price point, and it's realistically kind of written off as a marketing expense of like, oh, we know people love Tokalon, therefore we're going to buy Tokalon grapes and put that on the label, and that's going to help us sell. It's a marketing thing, right? But at a certain point, they're not marketing their own brand. They're marketing the vineyard, but they don't own that vineyard. So they're actually marketing Beckstoffer and not their own stuff. And I've seen this happen a handful of times where a producer will move away and say, hey, you know what? We're actually not going to buy, you know, wine or grapes from this particular vineyard. And this isn't necessarily exclusive to Beckstoffer. This happens, you know, with more than just him. Uh, but they stop using a certain vineyard. People, it's a big name vineyard of some sort. And people don't buy that wine anymore because it's not coming from that vineyard that they signed on for. Does that make sense, right? That you're marketing someone else's product. And in this example, you're marketing someone else's vineyard, someone else's grapes, not your own wine brand. And to a certain extent with consulting winemakers, I think that follows through. You know, if someone like a Heidi Barrett or Andy Erickson or Philippe Melka, uh, Thomas Rivers Brown, Michelle Roland, I mean, insert big winemaking name here, you know, is making that wine. And then all of a sudden, they're no longer making that wine. They just decide to part for what? Like no, no hard feelings, right? Like just hey, we just part ways. We're going to rely on our own winemaking team from now on, and you know we're all good in the hood, right? Would you see sales decline or drop off because of that? Because that person's no longer involved. That's a conversation that I actually have not had with anybody, and I'd be very, very curious to know whether or not that's been the case. So. I think this is, it's a bit of a, man, it's a bit of a, uh, I'm trying to like pick the right word here. I've been so fired up to have this conversation and record this episode that I'm just like, I got to take a deep breath here for a second. It's wild. You know, um, I do, I think, I think, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. At the end of that Wine Searcher article, I think Karen McNeil said something really, really interesting. And she said, quote, we don't even know what we're missing. We could be missing a whole new expressions of flavor and aroma and spice and texture. One of the reasons that people like you and me love wine is because it's such a head trip. You taste something and say, how do I put this into words? A lot like me trying to figure out what I'm saying right now on the show. How do I put this into words? This is a fascinating kaleidoscope of flavor. The, if the flavor is no longer a kaleidoscope, if it's just a few descriptors that you can use over and over again, it begins to collapse wine. If wine becomes somewhat interchangeable, why not buy the less expensive wine? Boom, there you have it, just like I was saying. And that was, that's, that was the point that really got me. You know, if you have these 
intense similarities. Albeit the wines are all well made, they're all solid, but if they're so similar and you have this crazy range of price points, why would you ever buy the more expensive one? Why would you sit on an allocation list for years waiting to get access to have the privilege to buy something that's hundreds of dollars a bottle when you can get it for around a hundred bucks? That's where this conversation goes. If you see these wines homogenizing and you see and taste wines, I guess you can't, I mean, you can look at wine. They all look kind of purplish, right? Reddish, purplish, bluish. But if you're tasting wines and they all are just getting more and more similar at a certain point, you're going to want something different. You know, I think those of us who are really into drinking wine, we, we constantly look for something that's kind of unique and different. And it doesn't mean we don't have our, our tried and trues, our Tuesday night pizza wines and our old reliables that we know it's like, you know what? I just want a glass of this. You know, for me, it's Flora Springs Trilogy. That's one of the wines where if I see it on a wine list, I got some in the fridge behind me. It's one of those like, hey, you know what? I just want a solid glass of red wine. I don't want to think twice about it. I just want to know that it's going to be great. And the Trilogy is one of those wines for me. Uh, Phillips Hill, uh, a great producer that unfortunately um, is no longer making wine up in Anderson Valley for Pinot Noir. That was one of those for me as well. It was like, hey, this is a Pinot Noir that I know every time I open up a bottle, I know exactly what I'm getting. And every time I open up a vineyard select one or kind of the blend of multiple of their vineyards, like I just know what I'm getting myself into. And I love the fact that these wines are unique. They have a sense of place. They stand out of the crowd. But going back to my experience with Napa Cabernet in the late 2000s and early 2010s, Napa Cabernet has lost a lot of its intrigue. It really has. And it's a damn shame because you have this continual arms race in terms of pricing. You know, I mean, what do you, you already have, I mean, according to some, you know, we're losing, you know, terrain and, you know, market share because of this high price. We're simply pricing people out. And I think if you continue down this path of, you know, wines homogenizing and becoming less and less interesting, you're going to have people, it's going to be an easy choice for people to make not to buy your wine. So as a producer, you got to look yourself in the mirror and look pretty damn hard and understand what are we trying to do? What do we want to be known for? Do we want to be known for the famous vineyard we don't own that we might not be able to access year in and year out? Do we want to be known for the consulting winemaker that might be here for a short period of time or a long period of time? Do we want to be known for ourselves? Do we want to be known for some combination of all three of those things? And how do we incorporate that, those ideas? And how do we still maintain some sense of place, some uniqueness, some interest, some intrigue in what we want to be known for? I think those are the questions that most of these producers have never asked themselves. They've simply said, hey, you know, we want to hire the biggest, baddest gun in the room. And that's what they do. And they run with it. And as a result, you're having wines, in my humble opinion, in Napa become way more alike than they are different. And that's a damn shame. This is going to be an interesting conversation. I think what's kind of a bummer about this, all said and done, to kind of wrap things up here, is that this conversation is going to be had by us wine geeks. This isn't something that's going to be had in your local wine shop. This isn't going to happen at your local restaurant. Distributors aren't going to talk about this. Uh, Psalms might not even talk about this. You know, you're going to have a chosen handful of us who latch onto this and say, hey, this is an issue and people should be paying attention to it. But if these wines are selling and these businesses are happy and these consultants are doing well for themselves, what's the difference? Is it really going to change? I suppose if you take anything from this conversation, one, definitely go check out. Uh, you should follow Karen McNeil if you're not already into wine. Uh, just do it, please. Uh, she's an incredible talent. Uh, check out this Wine Search article. We got links down in the description. And if you really give a shit about 
wine. If you really give a shit about just knowing where your consumer goods come from, how they're made, you know, who's making them and whether or not they're generic or not in some way, shape or form. This is the kind of stuff, I mean, yeah, it takes work, which kind of sucks. It shouldn't be this hard to understand where the things you love come from and why maybe they're more similar than they are different, you know, which would seem weird, right? It's like, why are these wines so similar? You know, do we honestly think like they're just big, sexy, silky wine? Like, that's great. It's yummy. But why? Why is there no X factor? Why is there nothing that makes this stand out of crowd? I'm paying hundreds of dollars a bottle here. Why does this not reach out and grab me like it should? You know, subjectivity aside, right? Because that's when it comes down to it. You know, that's what it's all about is it's subjective and you love what you love. But man... Hopefully y'all love the same thing because uh, this is the trend that continues. I mean, there's going to be a lot of a lot of very similar wines out there, and it's going to be tougher and tougher to hunt down the ones that actually stand out of the crowd. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I was fired up this episode. I mean, I was on one. This is an exciting topic for me. This is, as someone who does consult for both private labels and other producers, I think this is a huge point of contention. Uh, this is something that I actively try and avoid in my winemaking when I'm working for or with other projects is making sure that we're not, you know, using a specific set of criteria, that we are trying to be creative and that we are searching for some sort of X factor in the wines that I'm making. That is of the utmost importance to me. And it feels as though... At a certain point in the last 15, 20 years, that started to fade for many, many people. And that's a damn shame because I think you just have a lot of pretty good wine out there and far less great wine out there, particularly when it comes to Napa than ever before. Thank you all so much for tuning in. That has been this week. That has been this week's episode. This has been this week's episode. How? Man, I am so at a loss for words right now. God. Next time, I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to take a chill pill or something. I have to like go to the gym, work this out, and then come back and record an episode like this because I'm just so fired up and wanted to like dive headfirst down the stairwell into this thing. It's like, let's do this. We got to talk about consultants and how things are crazy in this industry. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, please be sure again to rate and review the show uh, if you have a chance. Follow us on all of our social networks at MTJ Wines. If you want to come to one of our tasting events, we actually have a few other winers that are joining us as well, both in Kansas City and in St. Louis this April. Again, uh, we're sold out in Chicago, uh, but you can head to our website, mtjwines.com. Check out tickets to those events. Please be 21 years or older if you're going to attend. And if we don't see you out on the road next month, we will for sure see you next week for the our end of the month question and answer episode be sure to submit your questions to the podcast you can slide into any of our dms on those social networks i mentioned head to our website mtjwines.com scroll down a little ways on the home page there will be a little form you can fill out to submit questions and we'll dive into some of those next week as well uh, thank you all so much for tuning in i appreciate you have a lovely rest of the day rest of the week We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.